Okay, so I think more people will be joining us as they finish up their illustrious discussions that took place during lunch, um, hopefully soon. Well, but, uh, but we have to move on. So welcome everyone to session three of our workshop in which we will be discussing endpoints for clinical trials with gene therapies. And many of you probably know that the decision about an endpoint or the choice of endpoint in any clinical trial can be the kind of decision that can sometimes make or sometimes break the trial in the end. And for any clinical development program with a novel therapeutic product, the choice of the primary endpoint for a clinical trial intended to demonstrate substantial evidence of that product or that agent's effectiveness can really be the solar plexus of that entire development program, which can either unite all of the elements of that development or make the product non-viable. So now when you feel the importance and the gravity of the discussion that we're about to have, I think we can start. <laughs> All right. My name is Larissa Laptua, and I'm the Associate Director in the Division of Clinical Evaluation, Pharmacology, and Toxicology in the Office of Tissues and Advanced Therapies in the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at the Food and Drug Administration. And I have a panel of three excellent speakers with me today. But before I introduce them and tell you what they're going to be talking about, I would like to show you a few slides, primarily to inform our discussions during the session. Mm -hmm. no, I honestly am pressing the button. OK. So let me first show you this product label. And it is from um, the end of 19th century. And this is pre-FDA era. And uh, so what it says here is that the product is Dr. Rolf's Pills. And Dr. Rolf's Pills is a domestic vegetable medicine that is advertised to be proper in all cases and alone sufficient for the cure of most. And so you or someone could get you know, that, that uh, type of product for a bargain price of 25 cents a box by appointment. And as you can imagine, under these conditions of trade, not both parties are supposed to be, but only one party would be better off following the trade. And that, unfortunately, would not be the patient-consumer side of the trade. So FDA was created in 1906. And its mission is to protect and promote public health. And I would like to also say that we do help advance science, contrary to what was said here before this morning. We facilitate and support scientific advancements. And of course, over the past 100 years, what is it doing to me here? OK. Over the past 100 years, the ways we evaluate whether a product works and whether it's safe have considerably changed. And um, as many of you know, nowadays FDA approves medical treatments for marketing, medical products for marketing, um, after they've been um, shown to be safe and after they've shown to have substantial evidence of effectiveness. Now, the substantial evidence of effectiveness has been defined and codified in the Code of Federal Regulations and described and discussed in a number of FDA guidances. But in a nutshell, for many diseases, it is typically two adequate and well-controlled trials, because you have to have an experiment and the repeat. In certain situations, for example, in rare disorders, it would be well, when, when the second trial may not be feasible or would be unethical or for maybe other reasons. So it would be one adequate and well-controlled trial with supportive confirmatory evidence. And that's the red circle in the right upper corner. Now let's look at the green circle. It talks about regulatory pathways for approval. 
And because we're discussing gene therapies today, and gene therapies are biological products, the two regulatory pathways for approval that are of interest to us today would be the traditional pathway and the accelerated approval pathway. In the traditional pathway, the endpoints, and now I'm in the blue circle at the bottom of the slide, the endpoints that are used in the adequate and well-controlled trials intended to demonstrate the product's evidence of effectiveness would be clinical endpoints that directly measure clinical benefit or surrogate endpoints that have been validated to predict clinical benefit. The accelerated approval pathway has been around since 1990s. It is typically reserved for situations when the disease is rare and when there, or, or when, when the disease is serious, often it, it would be a rare disease, um, and when there are no available treatments. It is intended and has been used in cases when the disease course may be prolonged and an extended period of time may be needed to monitor or to observe for the clinical benefit. Therefore, in order to make the development feasible and also to improve access to care to those who need it, um, accelerated approval allows use of endpoints that reasonably likely predict clinical benefit. Those endpoints could be both clinical and surrogate endpoints. So let's deconstruct this a little bit. Now, clinical outcomes, when they're used as trial endpoints, they would directly measure clinical benefit. I said this already. Clinical benefit, the way we view it, is how a patient feels, functions, or survives. And that's relatively easy to understand, which is not the case with surrogate endpoints. And if you've worked in the area of clinical research for a while, you may remember that 15, 10, or even fewer years ago, um, there was a lot of confusion as to what we call what. People were saying surrogate biomarkers, biomarker endpoints, clinical markers, clinical endpoints, and a number of other um, terms. And sometimes and oftentimes, in fact, um, people would be referring to different things. So it was recognized for a while that we needed some unification of terminology, particularly in the areas of translational research and drug development. And so in 2015, actually earlier than that, NIH and FDA joined forces and developed this BEST resource. And BEST stands for Biomarkers, Endpoints, and Other Tools. And according to BEST, surrogate endpoints could be roughly divided into three categories. And all of these categories are in the relation to the ability to predict clinical benefit. So a candidate surrogate endpoints um, would, would be the weakest uh, predictors, or they would still be under evaluation, perhaps, of how they relate to clinical benefit. Let's look at the uh, validated and reasonably likely. A validated surrogate endpoint would typically be supported by a clear mechanistic rationale and clinical data providing strong evidence that an effect on the surrogate endpoint predicts a specific clinical benefit. Reasonably likely surrogate endpoint would be supported by a strong mechanistic or epidemiological rationale, but there would not be enough clinical data to say that an effect on the surrogate endpoint predicts a specific clinical benefit. Which now brings me back to my colored circle slide, now presented in a more serious way, because we're talking about pathways for approval. So in the traditional approval pathway, the endpoints that are used in the adequate and well-controlled trials intended to demonstrate substantial evidence of the product's effectiveness would be clinical endpoints that directly measure clinical benefit or how a patient feels, functions, or survives, or validated surrogate endpoints that are known to predict the clinical benefit. In the accelerated approval pathway, the endpoints that are used, again, in the adequate and well-controlled trials intended to demonstrate the product's substantial evidence of effectiveness would be surrogate endpoints that reasonably likely predict clinical benefit or clinical endpoints that are measured earlier than the late heart endpoints, so to speak, um, long-term be uh, long benefits such as um, or long-term effects, um, such as effects on irreversible morbidity or mortality. So clinical endpoints in this case would be measured earlier. 
Um, products that are approved under the accelerated approval pathways are required um, to, they would be subject to post-marketing requirements to verify and describe clinical benefits. So in other words, manufacturers who are producing those products would have to conduct clinical trials in post-marketing with clinical endpoints to verify and describe clinical benefit. Now, all of this um, is nice and theoretical. How does it look like in regulatory practice? So over the years, FDA has approved um, many different products in different therapeutic areas. And uh, we've created listings of both surrogate endpoints as well as clinical outcomes assessments, clinical endpoints, that have been used for products that are approved for marketing, whether through traditional pathway or the accelerated approval pathway. Um, but we all recognize that for diseases for which most of gene therapies are being developed nowadays, there are no good endpoints. There are no clinical endpoints that are reflective enough of the disease that we're trying to treat. And so in those cases, we, we have to go on and develop novel endpoints or new endpoints. Um, this is my last slide because I'm introducing the topic to you, and I hope that we will have more discussions during the session today. Um, these are just some um, points that I wanted to highlight for us all to consider, but I'm pretty sure that many of you who have lived through design and conduct of clinical trials with gene therapies probably um, have your own points to share and to consider and for everybody you know, to remember when, when we're designing and conducting clinical trials. So gene therapies are um, therapeutically intentional to have long-term effects. Um, and of course, if we're talking about cure, we want that effect be there for the patient's lifetime, right? Which makes it very difficult, it leaves little room, in fact, for uncertainty about endpoint performance at the time when we design those trials. And it really requires increased vigilance in assurance of the validity and accuracy of endpoint measurement because we want endpoints to be valid and reliable and resistant to bias in the context of the trial for which we're um, employing them for, um, sensitive to the disease change, and also with sufficient discriminatory capacity to distinguish between the effect of the investigational product and the effect of the comparator. Now, mechanistically agnostic endpoints, of which there are many on the listings that I've shown you on the previous slide, that may be reflective of common pathogenetic pathways may not be sufficiently sensitive for gene therapy trials. We now have advanced molecular diagnosis um, uh, as, a, as a tool, and in fact, many um, diagnostic tools available to us, um, whole genome sequencing. And we can make diagnosis early. And with the advanced laboratory testing, we see this shift towards the need or more demand um, for both clinical and surrogate endpoints that are reflective of the early disease manifestations, because nobody wants to wait um, when, when you have the molecular diagnosis today, nobody wants to wait um, uh, when this loss of function or gain of function mutation, um, you know, years from now eventually will translate into um, irreversible organ damage. We also now have an opportunity to really tap into unknown previously genotypes. And when they are associated with phenotypes that are poorly characterized, there is, again, an increase in the need for novel clinical endpoints that can actually measure appropriately how the disease changes. And uh, um, surrogate endpoints um, traditionally have been um, viewed as markers or milestones along the pathogenetic pathway of a particular disease. And here with gene therapies, we have this universal pathway of gene transcription and transgene protein synthesis. Um, we can measure its levels. We can try to measure its function and understand how, how the clearance goes. So here along this 
universal pathway, maybe it is an opportunity to identify um, and validate surrogate endpoints that may be useful not just for one disease, but for a number of related diseases or for uh, entire classes of products. So I will stop here and um, um, introduce our first speaker.